Several months ago, Jeopardy fans were shocked when they tuned in to watch all three contestants miss an arguably easy question. It was one of the $200 questions, so it's supposed to be the easiest question in the category, but it was a Bible question. And it was a fill-in-the-blank Bible question that went something like this, fill-in-the-blank, our Father who art in heaven, blank be your name. And none of the three contestants even ventured a guess. People all over the internet were aghast. Atheists logged in to say, even we know the answer to that question. Hallowed be your name. God's name is holy. You know, sometimes we need to be reminded about simple things. Sometimes we need to be reminded among all the complexities of our lives and our day that there are some fundamental things we know to be true and we stake our eternal destiny upon them. We'll look at that this morning. So far, in our study of the book of Daniel in a series that I've entitled Unwavering, as we're looking at the unwavering faith of Daniel and his friends and the challenge for us to have an equally unwavering faith, we saw in the first six chapters that Daniel really gave us sort of a narrative of events that took place in Daniel's life and in the lives of his three friends. But now as we move into Daniel chapters 7 through 12, we're looking at sort of prophetic messages. They're not necessarily in chronological order. The one we looked at last week in Daniel chapters 7 and 8 was talking about some things that are going to happen in the future. And right at the end of Daniel chapter 8, we saw an angel. And Gabriel came to deliver a message that carries over into Daniel chapter 9. So if you brought your Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 9 as we look at a simple truth. Daniel chapter 9, look with me beginning in verse 1. And as he often does, Daniel begins by giving us the context. Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet, for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him in prayer and pleading with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, O Lord God, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and faithfulness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, we've done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke to us in your name, to our kings, our leaders, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, Lord, but to us, open shame as it is this day. To the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby, and to those who are far away in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of their unfaithful deeds which they committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, Lord, to our kings, our leaders, our fathers, because we've sinned against you. To the Lord God belong compassion and forgiveness because we have rebelled against him. We've not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has violated your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice, so the curse has gushed forth on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So he's confirmed his words. 
which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great disaster for under the entire heaven. There's never been done anything like this as was done in Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our wrongdoings and giving attention to your truth. So the Lord has kept this disaster in store and brought it on us, for the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we've not obeyed his voice. Now, Lord our God, you who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, made a name for yourself as it is this day, we have sinned, we've done wickedly. Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, for because of our sins and the wrongdoings of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of taunting to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas, and for your sake, Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. My God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city, which is called by your name. We're not presenting our pleas before you based on any merits of our own, But based on your great compassion, Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and take action for your own sake. My God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. If God were to make a promise to you, if you will do this, I will bless you. Would you do it? Well, we're going to see this morning that that's exactly what God said. God promised a blessing on his people if they would just simply be obedient to him. They failed. We're going to see how God goes to great lengths to restore them back to right fellowship with himself. Now, Daniel chapter 9 has been called one of the most complicated passages in the Bible. And what I want to suggest to you is while the passage is complex, the message is simple. And God has a very simple message to convey to his people through his children and especially through the faithfulness of Daniel. My favorite Bible passages on the simplicity of a relationship with God, on the disciplines that we practice spiritually, and how God honors the faithful rendering of his word. Daniel begins in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1 by giving us the context. This is the first year of the reign of Darius, which means this is around the year 538 B.C. For context, Israel has now been in captivity 68 years. Daniel was taken captive sometime around the year 605, and now they have been in captivity for all of this time. And we find the marking that's significant in the first couple of verses. This is the first year of Darius. We've seen Darius back in Daniel chapter 6. He's probably working under the authority of Cyrus, who was the king of Persia. Here, Darius, probably operating by the authority of Cyrus, declared as king in Cyrus' absence, he is a Mede. And now... Daniel beginning to unpack what will be a very important life lesson for him and indeed for all of Israel. So context, Daniel's reading the Bible. So we find in Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, Daniel is reading from the book of Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah was a prophet of God when Daniel was a young boy. Jeremiah was a prophet in the land of Israel, in the nation of Judah. He lived in Jerusalem until he was forcibly taken captive by his own people to Egypt, probably died in captivity to his own people in Egypt because of his message that he declared to Judah. 
Now, during Jeremiah's ministry, very few people really paid attention to him. They wanted to hear from Jeremiah, but they didn't want to listen to Jeremiah. Curiously, the one person who actually listened to Jeremiah was Daniel, and it took place after Jeremiah's death. In fact, probably Jeremiah's most effective ministry took place after his death. So now in Daniel chapter 9, God's using Jeremiah to influence Daniel to teach you and me a lesson about faithfulness to God. Daniel reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, God began to speak. God began to speak some very significant but simple truths. Number one, we need a word from the Lord. Daniel's reading the Bible, a good practice. Not surprisingly, as God often does, as Daniel was reading through the book of Jeremiah, God began to speak. Where do you turn when you need a word from the Lord. Paul had something similar to say in his challenge to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Look what the scripture says as Paul challenged Timothy. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. That from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith that's in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. God speaks through his word. Daniel's reading the Bible and says, when I opened up the scriptures, then I understood. I gave my attention to the word. I gave my focus to the truth. And all of a sudden, Daniel says in verse 3, when I turned my attention to the Lord to seek him, God began to reveal a message to me. Now, I was thinking about something significant. Daniel is in captivity in Babylon, 800 miles from Jerusalem. Jeremiah has since been taken captive to Egypt, the opposite direction. But somehow, in the providence of God, the writing of Jeremiah made its way to Babylon while they were in captivity. Now, I don't know Daniel's devotional habits. I don't know what his pattern of reading through Scripture was. Perhaps Daniel just read through the Scriptures chronologically. Perhaps he just read as the Lord led him. But as Daniel read from the Scriptures, God began to speak. It's one of the reasons I am such a proponent of reading the Bible. Because you and I will find, like Daniel did, when we read through the Bible, God speaks through his word. So in Daniel 9, Daniel's having his quiet time. He's reading through the Bible. He's not reading in order to receive a prophetic message. He is merely reading the Bible, and God began to speak. He's probably reading from Jeremiah chapter 29, one of two places where Jeremiah prophesied that Israel would be in captivity for 70 years. The other is in Jeremiah 25, but in Jeremiah 29, the attention turns to the time when Judah will come back out of captivity and then repopulate the land of Jerusalem. It's a passage that is perhaps one of the most frequently misapplied passages in all of Scripture. This is the passage where God says, I know the plans that I have for you. And believers love that part. We love that part of that verse where we hear God saying, I know the plans that I have for you. On top of that, they're good plans to give you a future and a hope. And indeed, that was God's message to Judah through Jeremiah, but there's context there. Because while there is a prophecy and a promise, both of them revolve around the context that Judah was already in captivity. 
And the message that God was giving to Judah through Jeremiah is you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. For context, take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, and I want you to see as as God spoke through the prophet to the people of his day, and now as God used that to speak to the people in Daniel's day. This is Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 10. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now stop there for just a second. Here's what God is saying to to Israel, to Judah. I know the plans I have for you. I know what I'm going to do in your life. God's not working out of panic. God's not working out of response to what everyone else does. I know the plans I have for you. But for now, the plans mean captivity. And the message that Jeremiah has just shared was to those people who are already in captivity. And the message was settle in. Build a house, plant a garden, have a family. You're going to be there for 70 years. I know the plans I have for you. They're good plans. They just don't fit in what you thought were the plans I have for you. But go on. Re- look, at, look at the next verse. God's just said, I have good plans, prosperity, not disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now verse 12, then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You'll seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Did you see that last part of that? You will search for me, and you will find me, When you search for me with all your heart, you might need to take a highlighter or a pen and circle that word when. You will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, Daniel has just read the prophecy from Jeremiah. You're going to be in captivity 70 years. Now, what I want you to note about Daniel is he believes in a literal interpretation of Scripture. Because Daniel reads this passage of Scripture where God, through the prophet Jeremiah, said, you're going to be in captivity 70 years. And Daniel looks at the calendar on his smartwatch and realizes we've been in captivity now 68 years. God said we're going to be here 70. It's time for us to pray. And all of that began as Daniel was reading God's word. Now Daniel came across that passage where God said, you're going to be there 70 years. And Daniel begins to claim the promise of God. God said, you'd be here 70 years. 70 years are almost up. I'm taking you at your word. God speaks through his word. People, we need a word from the Lord. But go on. Not only do we need a word from the Lord, we need to turn to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says in verse 3, I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and pleading with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now beginning in verse 4, down through verse 19, we have one of the longest recorded prayers of the Bible. But before Daniel gets to the prayer, I want you to notice the spiritual preparation that took place first in Daniel. Look what the Bible says. I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him with prayer and pleading. But along with that, Daniel says, came fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So think burlap, sackcloth. I put it over my bare skin that rubs against my skin to remind me the pain that my sin causes God. It is the grief over my sin. The fasting suggests the urgency, the diligence of Daniel's prayer because you and I know we never come before a holy God in an unholy way. 
And Daniel, before he pleads the mercy of God, begins to cleanse himself of his sin. He gets his own life right before God. And then Daniel begins to call out to the Lord in prayer. There are four parts to Daniel's prayer. Part number one, we've sinned. You see that in verses 4 through 6 when Daniel says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, great and awesome God, we have sinned. Not a surprise to God, but a confession by Daniel is now Daniel pleading and interceding first for his own sin and now for the sin of all the people because Daniel knows what the Bible says later in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 all have sinned and come short of the glory of God that's Daniel that's Israel that's America that's you and me We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the antidote to sin is confession. Where I come before a holy God and I agree with what he already said about me. And like David in Psalm 51, I pour out my confession before a holy God. It was the message of John the Baptist. It was the message of Jesus. It was the message of Peter in Acts 2, 38 and Acts 3, verse 19. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We come before the Lord in confession and humility, calling out to the Lord, God, we have sinned against you. That's the first part of Daniel's prayer. The second part of Daniel's prayer grows out of the recognition of the sin in our lives. Point number one, we've sinned. Point number two, you are righteous. Look at verse 7 down through verse 10. Verse 7, righteousness belongs to you, Lord. To us, open shame. Righteousness belongs to you. And Daniel just begins to call out some of the characteristic attributes of God. God, you're great and awesome. God, you keep your word and you are merciful. You are righteous. You are compassionate and forgiving. You are true to your word. You have rescued your people before. Look down at verse 15. You brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And in the same way that you did that for them, we're praying that you do that for us. We're sinful. You are righteous. We deserve judgment. Look at verse 11. Indeed, all Israel's violated your laws, turned aside, not obeying your voice, so the curse has gushed forth on us, along with the oath as it is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God. You told us this is what would happen when we sin. It's not a mistake. It's not an error in judgment. It's not a miscalculation. It is sin. We deserve the consequences of our sin. We're sinful. You're righteous. We deserve the judgment of God. You've called out to us, we didn't listen. You sent prophets in verse 6, we didn't pay attention. You sent your word through your servant Moses, we didn't pay attention. We have shame, we own our shame. It's on us, it's our fault. We deserve the consequences of our sin because we did not, we did not obey your word. Your wrath is right. We're sinful, you're holy, your judgment is right, now we plead for your mercy. That's the conclusion of Daniel's prayer, verses 16 through 19. Lord, in accordance with your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. Note, not based on any goodness on our part, 
Not because we're good, but because he's holy. Not because we deserve it, but because he's merciful. And Daniel pleading on the mercy of God, crying out to the Lord for forgiveness. There's no merit for God's mercy. That's why it's called mercy. I don't deserve it. There's nothing I can do to earn it. I just plead the favor of God. I own my sin. I admit my sin. I turn away from my sin, and I plead the mercy of God. Paul said in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance so Paul comes to what is the pinnacle the climax of his prayer in the last couple of verses verses 18 and 19 my God incline your ear and hear open your eyes and see the desolation the city called by your name we're not presenting our pleas before you based on our merits but based on your great compassion Lord hear Lord forgive Lord listen and take action for your own sake my God do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. This is the prayer of Solomon at the dedication of the temple. It was the prayer of Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 1 when he understood the crisis. It was the cry of the psalmist nine times in the Psalms and the cry of Daniel, God, hear our prayer. Not suggesting that God's not listening, but the idea is in, in, in hearing our prayer is the idea that God will hear and take action, that God will hear and forgive because in his hearing, God then steps in. We're crying out for the mercy of God. See, it works that way in our lives. Remember, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. It's, it's what we deserve. It's what our sins have earned. And the only basis for which you and I can come and stand before a holy God is pleading on his mercy. God, we've sinned. We're sinful. You're righteous. We deserve your judgment. We ask for your mercy. We need a word from the Lord. We need to turn to God in prayer. Finally, we need faith to trust him. The end of Daniel chapter 9 takes a pretty significant turn. Beginning in verse 20, really through the end of the book of Daniel, we find some of the most complicated and curious passages in all of Scripture, but I want you to see them in their context. Daniel's reading the Word of God, convicted of his sin, pleading before God in prayer for God's mercy. Now verse 20, look what the Bible says, while I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my plea before the Lord my God on behalf of the holy mountain of God, while I was still speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He instructed me, talked with me, and said, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your pleas, the command was indeed given. I have come to tell you because you are highly esteemed. So pay attention to the message and gain understanding of the vision Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the wrongdoing, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. And all of a sudden now, God has Daniel's attention. Notice, Gabriel interrupted Daniel while he was praying. He says it twice. While I was praying, he says in verse 20, he says it again in verse 21. So while I'm praying, God interrupted Daniel's prayer with the answer to his prayer. And the answer came in the form of the angel Gabriel. We see Gabriel in Daniel chapters 8, 9, and 10. 
And what I love about this passage is how Gabriel is dispatched by God to Daniel. So notice, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, the sin of my people, presenting my plea before the Lord on behalf of the mountain, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel came. The one I'd seen in the vision previously, he came in my weariness about the time of the evening offering, so about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he instructed me, Daniel, I have now come to give you understanding. So the first thing that we find about Gabriel is he interrupts Daniel while Daniel was praying. He interrupts him with the answer that God has, but then Daniel gives him an assurance. God sent Gabriel quickly. At the beginning of your pleas, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, you are highly esteemed. So now, Gabriel begins to unfold the message. While Daniel was praying, Gabriel interrupts him. God sent me. God sent me quickly. I came. Now, I don't know how long it took for Gabriel to get wherever Gabriel was to where Daniel was in Babylon. We'll learn next week from Daniel chapter 10 that there are things going on in the universe that you and I cannot fathom. Gabriel's probably engaged in that. But on the basis of Daniel's prayer, God dispatches Gabriel, and the text suggests he came quickly. And Gabriel has a word for Daniel. I'm here to give you understanding. When you first started praying, God started answering, and I've come because God loves you. You're highly esteemed. God has great affection for you. Maybe you just need to be reminded this morning God loves you. Daniel crying out to the Lord in prayer. God dispatches a messenger to remind him God loves him and to share with him a final truth. Six things, Gabriel says. Three have already happened. Three are yet to come. God sent me with the message. A lot of theological ink has been spilled over the content of this message of 70 weeks. Remember the context. Daniel's reading the Bible, learns of his sin, calls out to God in confession. God gives an answer, and here's God's answer. I'm working to finish transgression. I'm working to make an end to sin. I'm working to make reconciliation for iniquity. When you look at those six things, the three at the beginning, those three happened the first time Jesus came. Notice the next three. I'm working to bring everlasting righteousness. I'm working to seal up vision and prophecy. I'm working to anoint the most holy. Those three happen the next time Jesus comes. Here's what God said to Daniel. God has a plan and his name is Jesus. And there'll come a day in God's providential timetable when Jesus interrupts whatever else is going on in the universe to fulfill God's plan for the nations and for your life. Church, we need a word from God today. We need to call out to God in prayer. And we need to trust him by faith. I know the plans I have for you.